Hello and welcome to Nature Source Care. My name is Dr. Funda Goldman. I'm a naturopathic physician. And today I was going to go through uh, the similarities and differences of marmotherapy and acupressure. So let's go ahead. So note beforehand, uh, the information presented here is for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. For any symptoms that are severe or worsening, please contact a qualified healthcare professional. It's always important to determine the root cause of any disease and to develop a comprehensive treatment plan. Um, individual cases can vary in terms of treatments that are most effective, and solo therapies may not be appropriate or effective in all cases, so please keep those ideas in mind. Okay, so um, this talk is about marmotherapy and acupressure, but um, I, I mostly do marmotherapy myself, and a lot of people are not familiar with that, at least in the United States. So let me just talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, so marmotherapy comes from Ayurveda. Ayurveda is traditional Indian medicine, which is more than 5,000 years old. And in this paradigm of medicine, uh, everything is energetic. So it's an energy, ener energetic therapy. There are 117 marma points, or marmani, as they're known as in Sanskrit, on, on the body. And so in this uh, paradigm of medicine, you really have to kind of wrap your mind around the idea that people and states of disease or health are energies and waves that we can modify. Okay, and so the way that you work with these points is you can touch them. And I have a whole video on how to work with these points, but usually the main way is that you just touch these points and allow the energies at these points to rebalance. Yeah, that's a very simplified view of it. Um, there's more history in my first, very first uh, Marma video called Marma Points on Hand. And uh, I actually have a complete course here on my YouTube channel. So I've taught all the points, all 117 of them. So if you're interested in learning Marma Therapy, they're all in my Marma Therapy video playlist. Um, there are a couple of videos you might also consider. And these are follow along videos. So you can actually have an experience of Marma Therapy. The first one is Marma Points on the Hand, follow along. And then the other one is Marma uh, Therapy for Balance, Rejuvenation, Stress, and that's also a follow on. Um, so in general, though, since Marma Therapy comes from Ayurveda, to get a broader context and deeper context for Marma Therapy, you can also check out videos in my Ayurveda playlist. And then this is kind of a... a um, a little bit of a mini series, I guess, on comparison, uh, comparing Ayurveda and TCM, especially as it relates to marmot therapy, because I've had a few people ask me, you know, what's the difference? So that's where these videos are kind of uh, motivated from. So one of the videos is medical, the medical philosophies of Ayurveda and TCM, where I compare and contrast. Another one is um, the Ayurvedic perspective on perspective on pain. Because a lot of times what we're dealing with with uh, marma therapy or acupressure is pain, um, and then techniques of marma therapy, um, and that video is about different ways of working with the points, and some of them are more specific or overlap uh, between Ayurveda and TCM, yeah, traditional Chinese medicine, and some of them are, are distinct and separate. So there's more information in those videos for you if you're looking at you know what are the similarities and differences of these two. Okay, so the first thing um, I felt like is important to cover was um, the kind of energy grid or kind of energy kind of uh, lay of the land on the body as far as TCM and Ayurveda are concerned, because that will um, give us more information about how the points, specific points are different and how the points have different effects. Okay. So in both uh, TCM, traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda, they both have, um, ha have notions of channels that are used in organizing the energy of the body. And um, these channels are related to um, the life force uh, known as qi in traditional Chinese medicine and known as prana in Ayurveda. Okay, and these channels were intuitively perceived. So whether we're talking about the Chinese system of medicine or the Indian system of medicine, they were both originally intuitively perceived. Okay. So, and the names of the channels, the main channels uh, in TCM are called meridians. And the names of the um, channels, there are two different kinds of channels in Ayurveda, the Shrotamsi and the Nadis. Okay. 
So what happens in these channels is that energy collects and builds and then animates the being, the tissues and the functions and all this. Okay, that's what the chi and the prana are doing. And some of these channels, like the Shrotamsi, for, for example, they actually physically transport nutrients and fluids. Okay, and all of these channels are important for communication through the whole body, coordinating the whole body system. So sometimes it's energetically, like the meridians and especially the nadis, but with the shro um, it's like, you know, communicating uh, tissue to tissue by like enzymes, for example. Okay. So in both systems, um, they both see uh, this sort of channel system, even though they're different channel systems, as being sacred, as reflecting the external as as also being like a whole mind body unit, meaning that each one of us, in and of ourselves as a whole being, is a channel, and that channel is um, bringing energy, connecting energy from heaven to earth. Okay. So um, you know, it's it's a very profound system. You know, either one that you're looking at or both. Yeah. So if we're looking at the TCM model. Um, there's this whole sort of goal of aligning itself with natural law and natural rhythms. And by doing so, one creates harmony and balance. Okay, so when we're fighting against nature, fighting against cycles, that's when things become imbalanced. Okay. And so also part of this goal of aligning with, with nature is to become an empty vessel so that there's kind of less um, static on the line, so to speak. Less, less uh, we're more of a clear channel so things can just like flow through us rather than get caught, you know, and stagnant and sort of thing. And part of the energetics of this as well is not just sort of physically sort of clear and balance ourselves, but make sure that our thoughts and emotions are clear as well because we can completely get caught up in stuck or stagnant emotions and thoughts. Now, there are different ways in TCM to help us move towards this goal and uh, these are using things like meditation and qigong and tai chi uh, different modalities to help us achieve this harmonious flow of energy now, ayurveda has a similar goal but they use different tools and so in ayurveda they use yoga and meditation but essentially ayurveda is looking for the same thing in terms of how do we release our ego and how do we balance our material um, kind of duties with our spiritual aspirations and that sort of thing. Okay, so again, this is pretty deep and profound. Um, but again, most people when they show up in the office, they're just in pain. <laughs> they want to get out of pain, but you know, in a broader, deeper context, um, you know, when we get people out of pain, then they can move towards more balanced harmony and you know, potentially achieve these higher goals. Um, and again, the difference, the main difference in concepts between TCM and Ayurveda is that Western medicine does not really include the notion of um, at least uh, kind of modern Western medicine, not necessarily homeopathy, um, but, um, you know, it's an energetic model. So states of disease, uh, pain, uh, emotional states, all of these are energetic um, and so uh, there's not always a physical or visible component. Although, again, in Ayurveda, when we talk about the shrotas, that is, uh, those channels are a little bit closer to kind of Western thought. Okay, so again, all background for uh, the points. Okay, so more on energy channels. Um, now I'm specifically going to talk more about the TCM system of channels. Okay, now these uh, channels are classified broadly based on function and also location. Okay, and the different um, functions of these channels are various and they include things like transporting chi, so again, life force energy and blood. Okay, they regulate yin and yang, so those two opposing energies or complementary energies depending on, you know, the state of things. So yin is more of a receptive energy and yang is more of a kind of penetrating energy. And I get more into yin and yang if you're interested in that in my uh, medical philosophies. Uh, different, uh, different similarities and differences between uh, the medical philosophies of TCM and Ayurveda. These channels also help to protect the body from like um, outside influences um, that are, you know, uh, 
imbalance the body and the mind. Um, they regulate the flow of chi. They respond to dysfunction, meaning that um, when there's pain somewhere in the body, um, that's an indication that there's a dysfunction. And so these points, specific points, can be very tender if you press them. And that's an indication, like that's a way of diagnosing through the points, not just treating through the points, um, whether it's a TCM or Ayurveda, to give you more information about what's going on with the person and what kind of treatment they need to get back into balance and flow. Okay. And then there's also this notion of like integrating intelligence. So whether it's an energetic system or physical system, for the arms to coordinate with the legs, for the pancreas to coordinate with the stomach, you know, for the brain to coordinate with the heart, you know, all these things, there has to be some communication. So these channels support that okay. and uh, create, um, again, harmony and balance. So in TCM, there are 12 principal meridians. Six of them are considered yin uh, meridians, so kind of more receptive or cooling uh, meridians. And uh, they tend to be medial in the body. And then there are six young meridians, and they tend to be lateral in the body. Okay, And most of these run basically vert vertically from head to toe. And they're bilateral. So it's a very, um, for the most part, symmetric um, and much more organized system than the Ayurvedic system. Okay. And so I'll show you a picture. I think it's on the next slide, if not the next, on the next after the next. Um, but along these channels, um, you will see different acupressure points that run along the channels. Okay. So when I look at a TCM poster, I usually think of like a, um, like a train system in a big city where there's like these lines that most of them run parallel and some of them kind of shoot off to different corners of the city, but along the ways you have different stations. So you can, uh, that's, that might be a useful way to think about it. All right. So, and the thing is that energy can flow depending on the meridian and what's going on and somebody, energy can flow in different directions. Okay. Now, um, these are the names of the 12 principal meridians. Okay, so there's lung, large intestine, stomach, spleen, heart, small intestine. And then there's bladder, kidney, pericardium, san jiao, which is unique to TCM. San jiao, I believe, is kind of a water, like um, balancing water and fluids in the body. Um, it's not kind of... Um, well, none of these actually. I mean, so when I talk about lung and large intestine, stomach, spleen, if you're coming from Western model, you might specifically think that they're those physical organs. And that's not necessarily untrue, but there's more to it. So when they talk about lung and large intestine and TCM, or even like Ayurveda, um, they're talking about also this energetic system, not just a physical system. So that's important to know as well. So Sanjiao and then gallbladder liver. Okay, so those are the 12 principal meridians. And again, the important thing to know is that these organs that are listed here, even though the names are the same as the Western ones, are not conceptually the same. They are physical organs, but they're also energetic. And, it's, and by being energetic, um, they also include things like emotions and feelings. So, for example, when you talk about lungs in TCM and also Ayurveda, they happen to be the same in this case. Um, when you talk about the lungs, uh, Somebody might be talking lung, about lungs in terms of like somebody's coughing or uh, producing mucus or something like that. But when you talk about lungs in TCM or Ayurveda, you're also talking about lungs as being the seat of grief in the body. Okay. Now that's very different from Western medicine. Okay. Now, um, so, those are, so those are the 12 main train lines. You can think of the meridians in TCM and uh, the 12 organ systems. Now the organ systems, and again, they're not just physical organs, but the organs are considered to be the root. And then the channels kind of are a stem from the root. And then the stems go out to the surface, the external body, to the tissues and the sense organs, which are seen as the flowers. So there's actually this, um, I actually couldn't find an image of it, which was surprising to me, but there's this, you can kind of think of it as a tree. And it's called the Jinglao Luo, Luo. Sorry, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. So again, the if you picture a tree, the roots are the organs, so like long, large intestine, stomach. And then you have the 12 channels, which are like the stems or the branches, um, which are um, the meridians associated with these organs. 
And then from there, you have flowering out are the tissues and sense organs. So sense organs being like the eyes, the ears, the nose, because those are sort of gateways of bringing external sensory information into the body and affecting the internal milieu. Okay. So um, let's talk about the Jing Lu. Lo, sorry, I don't know how I'm going to pronounce that quickly. Um, so Jing means the 12 primary channels, and there are also eight extraordinary vessels and 12 divergent channels, which, uh, you know, again, just, just to break it down a little bit more for you. And the Luo are the collateral channels, the 12 sinew channels, and the 12 cutaneous regions. So you can see there's sort of like some of this is deeper and some of it's more superficial. Okay, so and then the notion here with TCM is that energy flows through these energy channels cyclically. Okay, so sometimes there's more energy naturally flowing in one of these channels than others, and it corresponds to different times of day. So there's actually kind of an energy clock that's associated with these energy channels as well. Okay, I think I have that on the next slide. Okay, so okay, so on the left here. This is a, you know, kind of fairly standard, I think. Again, I don't practice too much TCM. I have some training, but not a whole lot. Um, but you can see here on this body with the diagram, you can see where the lines are pretty much running up and down the body from the head, literally the top of the head to the toes. Okay, and you can see how they're pretty much symmetrical. I mean, they're not like scattershot, like just, you know, winding around each other. It's fairly organized here. Okay, and you can see the front of the body and the back of the body. Okay. So it does, as I said, and then you can see the little, you can barely see them, but like these little um, marks here, or probably script there, it's too small to read. But again, those are the points along the meridians or the train lines. Okay. And then you see on the right here, this is the clock of the energy running through the different uh, meridians. So you can see at the top here from 7 to 9 a.m., that's stomach time. So there's going to be a lot more energy running through the stomach. So uh, that's part of why that might be a good time to eat breakfast, for example. And then if you see, like, where is it? From 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., that's heart time. So that's when the heart can be more active. Not just the organ of the heart, but the meridian, heart meridian. Okay, so again, um, just to give you more, again, background on the channels and how they function in TCM uh, so that we can get to the points. So that was a little bit more about TCM. Now we're gonna talk about energy channels in Ayurveda. So in Ayurveda, there are two types of channels. There are the subtle channels, which are nadis, and these are energetic only. And then we have the gross channels with the shrotas, and these are more physical in nature. So the nadis are more similar to the meridians in TCM. They're energetic. They also carry thoughts and feelings and emotions, similar to the idea of meridians in TCM. The shrotas, however, are more similar to Western uh, notion of channels in the body. So like movement of fluids, to tissues and stuff. So the shrotas are more functional and the nadis are more energetic. Now the thing is one shrota will carry many nadis. So within the shrota are nadis, these energetic nadis. Okay. So, um, and the thing is, the shrota cannot operate without the animation of the nadis because, again, there's this energy life flow energy uh, going through the nadis. So if the nadis are disrupted, then that will disrupt the shrota. Okay. Um, the nadis sometimes are also called the prana vahini nadis, which means sort of propagating life force energy. Now, the thing is, there are 72,000 nadis, okay? That's a lot more than 12. <laughs> so, you know, all sorts of, you know, uh, back and forth. Um, and they branch off of the seven chakras. So if you're familiar with the chakras at all, there are seven chakras. They uh, line up along the kind of uh, midline of the body running vertically. And there's a root chakra, and it runs up to the at the kind of base of the spine, and it runs up to the crown chakra that's at the top of the head. Okay, so imagine seven kind of energy centers running through the center of the body, and then we have like 72,000 nadis branching off of those. Okay, now there are three principal nadis of the 72,000. <laughs> um, and these 
also run along sort of central um, canal of the person, or at least energetic canal of the person. Okay. So the main one is a shishumna, and this is fairly straight as it's visualized, and it's central. Okay. It starts at the root chakra and it goes up to the crown chakra. So the root energy wheel to the crown energy wheel. Okay. Um, and then all the other nadis, 72,000 other nadis, connect to it. So through the shishumna, since this is the main central energy channel, you can get kundalini energy ascending through this channel. The kundalini energy, it's, it's usually described as like this kind of um, coiled up energy, almost like a serpent. And um, as it starts to ascend, um, the shishumna and starts to balance and clear the chakras, then more and more the person can develop um, uh, spiritual clarity and kind of a more spiritual direction and, and motivation, and kind of spiritualize themselves in their, li their lives, essentially. Okay. Now, along with the sh uh, shishumna, um, there, one of the nadis in the shishumna is the vajra, which is a heating energy, and there's also the chitra, um, nadi, which is a cooling energy. So again, you have this kind of sort of similar thing where like, you know, balancing heat and cooling energy. Okay. Now, so that's the shishumna, the main channel. Then you have in addition to the shishumna, the ida and the pingala. Okay. Ida uh, starts at the base of the spine with the shishumna and it runs kind of goes uh, back and forth. It kind of weaves between, and I have a picture on this, so I just try to imagine it now, but then you'll see a picture coming up. Um, the edus uh, weaves back and forth between the chakras, and it ends up at the crown chakra as well. And the pingala, uh, if the ida, sorry, if the ida uh, nadi is um, uh, more lunar, feminine, cooling, yin type energy, and it ends up in the left nostril, terminates in the left nostril. Then the pingala is um, uh, terminates in the right nostril, but it's more solar, masculine, heating, and yang energy. Mm. So again, you do sort of a little bit have this, um, not quite as extensively as in TCM, but in Ayurveda, there's this idea of balancing of heating, cooling energy, feminine, masculine, yin, yang. So the Ida and Pingala run parallel to the Shishimna, but they kind of weave back and forth across the chakras, okay? So they all three, these start at what's called the Yukta Triveni, which is sort of the meeting of three rivers. I think that might be a literal translation at the base chakra, the root chakra. And then the Shishimna goes straight up, and the Ida and Pingala are kind of weaving back and forth up the you know, parallel to Shimna, and then all three of them end up at the Mukta Triveni, which is like the kind of the exiting point of the three rivers. Okay. And by doing things like alternate nostril breathing, because the Ida ends in the left nostril and the Pingala ends in the right nostril, you can regulate the breath, but also regulate energy and you, the way your mind works and your emotions, that sort of thing. The other thing to know is, again, there's this like shifting of energy. So at every 90 minutes, there's a shift at where either the Ida or the Pingala, become, one of them becomes more dominant for 90 minutes, and then they shift, and they do that all day long. Okay, so if you're very aware of your breathing, um, uh, then you will be able to notice the change, but most people are not paying enough attention to that. Okay, so um, there are 10 principal nadis uh, that connect with the 10 bodily gates or sense organs, again, in Ayurveda. So this is sort of similar to the Jing Lu, um, but there there were the, what was it, 12, 12 meridians, right? And the 12 uh, organs. So in Ayurveda, we have the Shishumna, which is connected with the frontinelle. So that's the top part of the head, um, like the, of the frontinelle where the that soft, that soft spot for children, like you have to be careful of with the newborn babies because the uh, cranial bones haven't completely emerged. Um, then there's the Ida, which ends in the left nostril, the Pingala, which ends in the right nostril, the Gandhari, which ends in the left ear, the Hasta also, or the Jiva, two different names for the same thing, that ends in the right ear, the Chakshusha, which ends in the left eye, the Alambusha, which en ends in the right eye, the Sarsvati, which ends in the tongue, 
Fufu nadi, which ends uh, in the excretory egg organs, and the shakini nadi, which ends in the genitals. So you can see all of these nadis, they end up, even though they're all uh, internal, they do have like a exit gate, so to speak, um, that end up in the sense organs. So again, the sense organs are responsible for transmitting information about the external world so the internal world can adjust physically, mentally, emotionally. Now, so we've been talking about nadis pretty much so far, but they're also the shrotas. So there are 14 major shrotas. So again, these are more the physical channels where the nadis are, are the more energetic channels. And there are three receiving shrotas, three elimination shrotas, seven tissue shrotas, and one for the mind. So altogether 14. Okay. Now, the functions for the nadis and shrotas, you can see there's some overlap with TCM. There's also a daily clock. It's different from the daily clock of TCM, and I have a picture of that, I think, on the next slide, so you can see, compare and contrast. But the functions of the nadis and shrotas, so um, there's prinana, which is nutrition and immunity. So again, the, these channels are uh, sending energy, uh, the nadis are sending energy, and the shrotas are sending like fluids and you know the enzymes and that sort of thing. Um, there's jivana, oxygenation, and prana. There's lepana, covering, protection, strength, and movement. So some of these uh, organs, uh, channels, protect organs as well, yeah. Then there's dharana, so supporting and structure. Uh, snehana, lubrication, insulation, and beauty. So like um, um, like the oily oiliness of skin and joints, like lubrication of joints, that's important so that they move. You can move properly without injuring your knee. Cools the knee and provides lubrication. Then there's like lubrication also of the skin. So that's another organ. So which creates, you know, if you have a balanced lubrication of your skin, that tends to be more beautiful in most people's eyes rather than too oily or too dry. Okay. Then there's Purana, which is um, communication, uh, learning, and memory. And then there's Prajnana, which is procreation. So those are the different functions. Okay. Now the Nadis and Meridians, uh, now, okay, now I'm going to get into comparing and contrasting a little bit of the channels between the TCM and Ayurveda. So Nadis and Meridians are interconnected because you have meridians that connect with each other, you have nadis that connect with each other right through the chakras. But the shrotas are not interconnected. They're separate systems, separate channels. And those are, again, the physical channels for Ayurveda. Meridians are classified by location. So like, you know, you know the lever, lung, arm, leg, that sort of thing. But nadis are not. Meridians um, access external points. Um, so the, that's why you can actually map meridians on a body, um, because there is actually this uh, access uh, to the external space. But nadis and shrotas are deep in the body, so except for the exit, you know, the exit uh, sites, um, they are not accessed. The nadis and shrotas are not accessed, uh, have access to the external world. Okay. Meridians can be mapped on the body, as I mentioned. Nadis and shrotas are not. Um, the energy flows from point to point on meridians. So again, in meridians, it is almost like a train, an energy train. But in shrotas, that is not true. Okay. Then meridians and shrotas um, both connect with organs, but nadis don't necessarily because nadis are, again, the energy um, lines, channels. Okay. So comparing and contrasting. So I do have pictures now. So these are the energy channels, the three main energy channels on the left here. So you can see this person sitting in lotus position. And then right up the middle here, this yellow line, this is a shishumna. This is the main nadi, the main energy channel. And then it starts down here at the root chakra, the muladhara chakra, at the yukta triveni. And then you can see the Ida's in this kind of orange color and it's going back and forth, okay? And it's going back and forth where it's kind of uh, uh, crossing this blue line, which is the Pingala. So Pingala is the solar energy, Ida is the lunar energy, the yin and the yang. Um, they cross at the different chakra points. So down here we have this sort of 
I don't know, bullseye type thing. Uh, that's the root chakra. But if we go up where the yellow or the orange curving line and the blue curving line meet, that's going to be the second chakra. And if we move up to the next inter intersection, that's going to be the third chakra. Then right to the middle of the chest, that, that uh, intersection is the fourth chakra. Then the intersection at the throat, that's the throat chakra. And then uh, here at the third eye chakra, the Ajna chakra, this is the Mukta Triveni. I might have said the Mukta Triveni was at the crown chakra before, but it's actually at the third eye chakra. So if I misspoke before, uh, please correct your notes. Um, and then on the right here, this is the Ayurvedic clock, organ clock. So you can see it's different. There are different organs. There are different times um, and time categories. Also, each uh, two, and th this goes by two hour increments here. So there's 12 of these. Um, you can see every four hours we switch. In the middle here, I have P, P, V, V, K, K. Those relate to Pitta, Pitta, Vata, Vata, Kapha, Kapha. So those are the three main kind of energetic imbalances. So Pitta, you can loosely translate as fire. Vata, you can loosely translate as air. And Kapha, you can loosely translate as earth. So you can see from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., that's Pitta time. All four hours are Pitta time because you have those two red peas there. The first two hours is stomach time. So that means the stomach is going to have more energy and that's a good time to eat lunch. Then uh, from noon to two is heart time. There's going to be more energy in the heart um, organ. Yeah. So again, you can compare and contrast that with TCM. Okay. So now we've been, I've been talking about channels uh, pretty much so far, but let me talk about the points. So the specific points, so you can see like this diagram here with the line coming down. So this is the energy line, the meridian here. And it looks like I'm guessing long because LU I think is long. Um, yeah, it could be. And then the different points here though are the acupuncture, acupressure um, points. Okay. So in TCM, they are called acupoints or acupressure points. And most acupoints have been mapped to meridians. Not all of them though. So um, Let me just see what are right not Marmani. Oh, okay. So again, Marmani have not. So that's a difference. Okay. So this is again fairly standard. You can get like that poster. The, you know, I've seen that poster with the meridian lines and the different points. I've seen that on a lot of people's walls, offices. Yeah. Okay. So the acupoints, these are locations where chi, this life force energy, is infused, particularly, I think, strong. And surfaces uh, to and surfaces on the body, so it's almost like a little window of the energy going through the meridian or the energy points is what my understanding is. Okay, and again, these acupoints serve as both points of diagnosis and treatment. So if, if something is tender, if one of these points is tender, that gives information about how the chi is flowing or not properly through the meridian. Okay. And a lot of these points are actually named after water. Um, again, there's this, it kind of reflects this notion that she is moving along the meridians like a flow of, instead of water, energy, but, you know, you can kind of think of it as, as water, I guess. Um, that made sense to the people who named them. Um, so, and the other thing is that these acupoints are classified. So, uh, the right, there are regular points, and there are 361 of these. These are the main clinically used points in, uh, you know, TCM, acupressure, or acupuncture. There are also extra points that don't follow the meridians, um, and these have specific names and locations, but they are not associated with meridians. Then you also have what are called ashi points, and these are unfixed tender spots. So there's no specific name or location. So if there is a, a you know a tender spot somewhere in the body, that creates an acupoint just by being tender. So what that means is any part of the body can potentially be an acupuncture acupuncture point. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And then the thing is, along these meridians here. There are usually five main points on each meridian that are known as just shoe points. And these main shoe points are kind of the main directors of the chi. So it's kind of like if you have a river and then you have five major dams or aqueducts or whatever where you can control the flow 
um, each meridian has five of these, okay? And so they're called, um, when you see like the word Jing, that means well. So this is where the qi bubbles. And I don't exactly know what that is because, again, I don't do acupuncture. But there's a, di there's a different kind of flow. That's what you can get from this terminology here. Then there are the ying uh, points, shu points, which ying means spring. So this is where the qi gushes. Then there's the shu uh, points, which not just like the shu, all five of these are shu points, but there's one actually called shu, and shu means stream. This is where the qi flourishes. And again, I don't exactly know what this means, but somebody who practices acupuncture um, will know. Um, then there are the Jing points. Uh, again, Jing, re, re, uh, same, as far as I know, this is the same Jing word. But in this case, Jing, I think they probably use a different symbol. So it's probably, um, sounds, the sound is the same, but probably the um, script, uh, the, because um, uh, sometimes, uh, in, at least in, I know Japanese, uh, at least in Japanese, you'll have the same symbol, uh, script symbol, but, and it has the same. Um, excuse me. Sometimes you'll have words that sound exactly the same. They're homonyms, but if you look at the traditional script, they'll be different. And so by knowing the different script, you'll know which one is which. So it looks like, I'm guessing, and it's only a guess, that Jing um, with a different script would mean river. Okay, and this is where the qi pours. Then there's the he or the he. I don't know. Um, and this means sea, and this is where qi flows. Okay, so again, meridians, the different points, and the different points mostly follow the meridians, but not all of them. And you can get potentially points anywhere in the body. And a lot of these are named after water, so good for diagnosis and treatment. All right. Then if we look at energy points of Ayurveda, so uh, marma points or marmani, there are 117 points on the body. The classification is, is a different system. So there's six main uh, kind of areas or regions of the body. So head slash neck, trunk, and then the four limbs. So six main total locations or regions. Um, and this comes from uh, Sushurta, who is a main, who wrote the main text, kind of the primary text in Ayurveda. Okay, then classification very much diverges here. So then we start looking at... Uh, points as whether they affect doshas and subdoshas. So doshas and subdoshas are, the doshas are vata, pitta, kapha. So again, loosely, trans loosely translated as air, fire, earth. And within each of these, there are five subdoshas. So for example, just to give you one, there's something called shleshika kapha. Shleshika kapha is responsible for the lubrication, the fluid within the joints. So there's certain marmani that affect glacia kapha. So if you're trying to increase or decrease lubrication of joints, you would probably want to work with those points, points that are associated with this, but not all of the 117 points are. Okay. Then uh, these marmani, they each are associated with different elements. So there are five elements in Ayurveda. There's ether slash space. There's air, there's fire, there's water, and there's earth. So just as one example, Ajna uh, Marmani, which is the third eye Marmani, is associated with ether or space. And this uh, point, if you stimulate it, can uh, stimulate or enhance the tra transmission of intuition, which is a very etheri etheric energy. Okay, And this can also um, increase spiritual power through the intuition. Okay. Then these marmani points are also uh, categorized based on organs slash srotas. So all uh, marmani points affect the local tissue. So if you have points on the hand, they affect the hand. If you have points on the feet, they affect the feet. But they also, a lot of times, will have far-reaching um, effects as well. So for example, the shanka point on the temples of the head um, if you uh, cool those points down, it will actually help reduce stomach acidity. So you have both local and far effects. Okay. Then some of these points are also um, noted for their degree of vitality. So what that means is some of these points are so um, vital and strong in terms of the energy that they collect and 
and balance uh, and what have you, that if you have injury to these, some of these marmani, and there some, there's eight great, also known as sadhya marmani, and there are five special marmani. So these 13 specifically, if there's injury here, it can cause serious damage or death to somebody. So if you watch my first video on uh, mar marma points on the hand, where I get into more of the history um, of marma uh, therapy, that these energy points, marma therapy points, were mostly derived by through sports, through contact sports and martial arts. So when people would get hit in certain places, um, they would notice different things would happen in their body. And so that was kind of the origin um, of marma points. So, um, important to know that of the 117 points in Ayurveda, marma points in Ayurveda, 75 of them have direct correlates with TCM. Now, that means that they're in the same location. The thing, though, is that just because they're in the same location does not mean that they have the same indications, at least what's been classically laid out in classical texts in both traditions. Okay. So, the other thing to note, because uh, I'm going to get into specific points just to give you examples, is that also um, the way that you determine where these energy points are are measured in both Ayurveda and, and TCM, and their way of measuring is different. Okay. So you use basically your fingers to measure, or not your fingers, actually the patient, the person who's being worked on. So they might be yours if you're working on yourself. But the measurement is based on the patient, not the practitioner, because if the patient's very large or very small, that'll change the portions, okay? So in TCM, they use what's called a kun, and kun is the width of a thumb. In Ayurveda, they use what's called angula, and that's the width of the middle finger at the MIP joint, that big joint in the middle, okay? Now, the thing is, the thumb is wider than the middle finger even at the IMP joint, okay? So um, uh, you can convert back and forth. So one kun in TCM is equal to 1.25 thereabouts angula. One angula is equal to about 0.8 kun. Okay, so they measure a little differently. They use a different finger to measure, you know, where things are on the body to low-key points. So that's also important. Okay, so here are three examples. Okay, now these three examples, you'll see. So um, this first one here, this is where the TCM point and the Ayurvedic point are in the same location. Okay, so this is the, in Ayurveda, this is the Padacharana. Uh, so it's, uh, you can translate as foot movement in Sanskrit. So there's one on each foot right here in the front anterior space of the ankle. And specifically, so there's two of these, um, symmetric on the body, um, both feet. So there's the anterior aspect of the ankle joint. There's a depression between the tendons of the hallucis longus and the extensor digitorum longus. So if you know your Western uh, anatomy terminology, you'll know what this is. But basically, it's kind of like uh, the space. If you There's a tendon that runs up the through the second toe and then from the big toe. And there's a little space between those two tendons, and that's where you're looking for. So you can see that little one in the diagram. Okay. So the energies associated here. So again, the Marmani points in Ayurveda are categorized based on subdoshas, and these are subdoshas. So this may not mean much to you, and that's okay. Um, but you know, just to be thorough. So pranavayu, vyanavayu, apana vayu, alochika pitta, shleshika kapha. So that one you should know, right? So lubrication of the joints. But again, this isn't like uh, super critical unless you're like a deeper student of Ayurveda. Now, again, in Ayurveda, this particular point, the Padacharana, is helpful for local issues. So ankles, like pain, edema, swelling, circulation of feet, coldness. It also has long uh, you know, distance organ effects. So the bladder, so things like cystitis and pain, also the colon, so, you know, excretory organs here. So uh, colon dysfunction, constipation, flatulence, flatulence, it also can help the eyes. You can see local and, you know, distant uh, effects here. The right, the point on the right leg is associated with the ascending colon, and the point on the left leg is associated with the descendant colon, ascending colon. 
Okay, so that's the Ayurveda in the white text here. Now I've added in the TCM. So this is actually from my uh, Marma points on the foot video, but I don't have, I didn't include TCM uh, because again, I'm not deep into TCM. I'm not a practitioner. I didn't feel, feel like I'm actually that comfortable you know, teaching a whole class on this. Um, but I just wanted to point out a few examples of where things are similar, but different and sometimes both, okay? So in TCM, there's the very same point in this very same spot. It's the stomach 41 uh, um, acu point, um, which is called the ji chi. I don't know how to pronounce that, um, which translates as steam divide. Okay. Now the indication, so it's the same for both points, TCM and Ayurveda. They both help the foot and ankle and also constipation. But the TCM point, at least in the literature, it's not to say that this won't work in Ayurveda. This is just to say that in the traditional literature, these other things have been associated with this point. Okay, so things like hypertension, vertigo, sciatica, headaches. So we get into the head here. Um you know, uh, whereas the marma points go to the eyes, this goes to more of the circulation in the head and vertigo consciousness, sciatica. So rather than going deep with the colon, this is more superficial with the um, uh, sciatic nerve and muscles, uh, the muscles associated with that. Abdominal pain and bloating. Um, there's no abdominal pain and bloating on the marma, you know, in the marma literature. And then we also have emotions like mania, agitation, sadness, and fear. So the emotions here are associated with this jishi, I'm guessing, point. I don't know how to pronounce it. Stomach 41 point. So there are other indications here. So you can see there's some overlap. It's the exact same point. Indications have some overlap, but not complete. So there's some similarities, but not between the two systems. So that's one example of a point where it's the exact same location in both systems. Now, the next point is the chipra, which translates as foot, immediate foot, or foot immediate, okay? So there's one on each foot, so there's two total. And this is in the, again, in the Ayurvedic system, this point is in the middle of the, the base of the big toenail. So you can see in this picture here, this little two in, in brackets or parentheses, that's at the midpoint, it's supposed to be at the midpoint of the nail, okay? Um, the energies associated with this are the pranavayu, udanavayu, vyanavayu, apanavayu, tarpagakafa, shleshakakafa. So again, don't worry about this unless you're a student of, a deeper student of Ayurveda. The indications, again, from the Ayurvedic side, so local pain and swelling, the mind, he headaches, migraines, insomnia, pituitary gland, balancing hormones, it activates prana, so life force energy. There's effects on the heart and lungs, so things like just general function, also shortness of breath. So this sometimes can be used as an emergency point. It also helps affect um, balance in the sexual organs like ovaries, testes, prostate. It regulates the kundalini energy. So like, for example, if you sit in half lotus position and your foot is tucked under your tush and, you know, there's pressure on your toe, this will actually help to decrease libido. So that, you know, again, if you're coming from the perspective of, oh, I want to manage my libido so that I can use that life force energy in more spiritual ways rather than kind of sexual ways, that's how you go about that. Okay. Now the point on the right foot stimulates pitta or fire energy. The point on the left foot stimulates kapha energy or earth energy. And if you stimulate both of them, you can balance vata energy. Okay, and then I get into here about how um, there's this, this practice where you can actually kind of suck in your anus. It's called the Ashvini Mudra. It's it, it kind of um, it's an energy lock essentially, and what that does is that's another way to help um, move Kundalini energy along upwards uh, to the Ajna chakra, Ajna chakra as well as the Crown Chakra to bring all this energy down in the loins upwards for spiritual awakening, as opposed to allowing it to move downwards, which uh, moves us in the direction of more materialistic energy functions such as sexuality. So again, for people who are um, you know, looking to uh, ascend spiritually, that's how you do it. 
The other thing is some people will use a copper uh, ring on their left toe, and this helps to stimulate uh, the right brain for intuition and creativity. So look at all that. <laughs> you had no idea that the midpoint of your, the base of your big toenail could do all that. Now, now if we weave in the TCM here. So first of all, this point does not have a direct correlation with TCM. Okay, but there are two points very close to it. So you can see here LR1 in blue and SP1 in green just on either side. So this is liver one point and that's in the lateral side of, so it's still at the base of the tail nail, but on the lateral side and SP1 is spleen one and that's on the medial side inside of the toenail. So two points just sandwiching this uh, Marmani point. So the spleen one point, also called yin bai, uh, translates as hidden white, and the liver one point is da dun, which translates as big mound. Okay. So indications. These also, so the TCM points also regulate blood flow and excess menses, because we talked up here about balancing sexual organs, feet, consciousness, emotions. So those are the same. So there is some overlap. Okay. Now you have two different points in TCM. So the SP1, spleen one point, treats blood and urine, stool, vomit, nosebleeds, and has digestive function like vomiting, diarrhea, loss of appetite, and bloating. Those are all different. So those are all unique to SP1, spleen one, and TCM. Now liver one uh, supports the genital area. So that's kind of similar here. Yeah, it is similar here. Um, but also urinary dysfunction. So let me just check. And the, the Marma point does not mention urinary dysfunction, you know, um, and neither one of these points treats insomnia or hormonal imbalance. So you can see that the location is different. There are two different points sandwiching very close to the Marma point. There's some overlap of function, but they also all have, all three of them have unique functions as well and unique indications. This last point here, this is Parshni, uh, translated as heel in Sanskrit, and it's right here. You can see at the very, at the bottom of your foot, you know, either way, whether you're standing up or sitting down, the very base of the heel in the back here and the center of the foot. Um, there's one on each foot, so two total. So this is one angula, so middle finger joint, <laughs> uh, inferior to the calcaneal tubercle posterior aspect of the heel. So basically it's just the very midpoint of the back of the heel, just above where you would step on it. Okay. So the energies associated here, the Vyana Vayu, the Apana Vayu, and Shalisha Kakafa. So all three points I've talked about help with joint lubrication. So indications, again, from the Ayurvedic side, local, because again, all Marma points have local function. So feet, pain, circulation, edema, swelling, arthritis, tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, these can all be treated here. Um, there's also some, again, more farther, farther reaching, uh, effects. So it helps the lower back. So things like lumbar radiculopathy, so sciatica, lumbar, lumbosacral pain also help sexual organs. So again, balancing issues with ovaries, testes, prostate. Now, the thing is there is no corresponding point in TCM, nothing close to it, nothing like it. So this is a complete, you know, no overlap, completely unique thing to Marma therapy. And because there are so many more, because there's what, three, 371 acupressure point, acupuncture points, clearly there are a lot more in acupuncture, acupressure that don't, cor that don't correspond with the money. So again, some overlap of, of location, some overlap of indication, but clearly not same system. Okay, well, I uh, appreciate you stopping by, listening to one of my talks. Hopefully this um, provided some insight and clarity about similarities and differences between uh, marma therapy and acupressure, how they're similar, how they're different. Both are true. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, I do have another YouTube channel if you're interested. Uh, I do a Vedic Astrology as well. So the other YouTube channel is on, it's called Heart Light Vedic Astrology. I do uh, interpretation videos there as well as teaching videos if you're interested. But as always, I hope that um, this provided some insight and clarity. Um, it was useful and interesting to you uh, in your own health. All right. So until the next one, take care.
Namaste.